Hey TiVo, it's so good to see you online today. I hope you are keeping well behind that screen of yours. We're in week three, nearly there, so hang on. Blow up the chat right now, tell your friends I'm doing okay. I hope you are doing well as well. So next couple of weeks, uh, we are going to be focusing on building church community as well as learning to engage deeper with God. And let me tell you guys, I'm so excited to have Christine and Edwin preach to you because I really know they're going to take you to another level in your perspective. They're going to transform your life. So make sure you stick around and invite a friend for gatherings online. Amen? So today, uh, the title of my message is going to be Resonance. And I'm going to take you just a little bit more into Pentecost, is that all right? And share with you this amazing message that I really think is going to bring us together. So Acts chapter 4, verse 32, just once again, let's read. It says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking God's word with confidence. The community of believers was one heart and one mind. None of them would say, this is mine about any of their possessions, but they held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. So the period we're now entering on our Christian calendar is the time after Pentecost. Duh, right? But it's also very funnily known as ordinary time which I find funny because really there was nothing ordinary about the church after the Holy Spirit came. They were now an empowered community, moving powerfully, sometimes in even more extraordinary miracles than Jesus himself, which I love because it tells you who our God is. He's not a guy who hoards power, but loves to give it away to us. They were also a radical church. The world around them was being blown away by the generosity with which they lived towards people and community. They had favor with God and favor with people, the Bible says, which means basically they were liked by God and they were liked by people. I mean, imagine that, right? Christians that were actually liked by God and people. The Holy Spirit had changed them you know, started to grow their confidence in who they were as a new group. And there was more than enough grace, the Bible says, not just on their leaders, but the entire church, everyone. You see, for a lead pastor like myself, guys, this is the dream. To build a community, a spiritual home that is God's dream church, that is our collective dream church. You know, I believe a dream like this needs the Holy Spirit. We need some supernatural help. Amen. And so this season while we're separated, I'm really believing for there to be supernatural help from the Holy Spirit, for you to get excited about God, for you to renew your passion, for you to have deep encounters with the presence of God. But I also believe that this dream that we're building requires each of our hearts and hands to build it together. We can't do anything great on our own. We don't need to do life on our own. We can do it with each other. So let me tell you, right, one of the crazy things I learned about recently is this thing in neuroscience called limbic resonance. And it's about how our human brains actually depend largely on external sources in order to manage itself. Which means that human beings, you and me, we rely on and we need each other for our well-being. In fact, do you know, the people that we are in closest physical proximity with, the people we allow to have emotional influence on our life can literally alter our hormone levels, influence our heart rate and our cardio function, our sleep rhythms and our immune function, even your emotional stability. Not only can we, because of limbic resonance, catch physical health from each other, we also catch mental wellness from the group of people that we are with. And this is due to our brains having what is called an open-looped limbic system. It's what allows, it's this, it's this system that allows for us as human beings to come together to bond and to form community, particularly when we are in physical proximity to one another. 
So one of the things I learned too was from this guy called Daniel Goleman. Now he's the guru of research into emotional intelligence, okay? And he found that the more a group of people spend time together on a regular basis, whether it's a business organization or a successful sports team, for example, the more time they spend together, the more their moods literally begin to synchronize over days and weeks. In fact, his research team estimates that up to 20 to 30% of any team's performance was directly dependent on how good they were feeling and gelling together as a group. How resonant they were with each other in their values and their culture. How resonant they were with good vibes, good feelings, atmosphere as a group. So why don't you type that in the chat today to all your friends here at TiVo, say to them, I want us to be resonant with good vibes. Building a dream community, guys, is supernatural, but it's also a deliberate effort. Becoming one heart and one mind, as Acts describes, in a positive way, to a point where others can see God's grace on us, on our lives, it takes intentionally engaging with God and with each other. So today I want to share with you three ways the early church did this, okay? So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, another section says, The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to anyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And so the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. So the first thing I noticed when I read this passage is that their community was devoted to, number one, a shared philosophy. Now, listen, what do I mean by this? This is more than just what they believed about God. It was how they believed in God. You see, at this point of time, when the church was still young and being pioneered, there probably weren't a lot of rules in place. There certainly weren't any statements of faith. Heck, you know, even the Bible as we know it today that we preach in church, some of it wasn't even written yet at this point of time. And it wouldn't be compiled for another 200 years. So if you've been a Christian for a very long time, just think about that for a moment. Because too often we preach this verse, the one that I just read, myself included, where we say, you know, once upon a time, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then we use that to go, you see, see, this is our authority. Let me tell you, I have the correct rules for church. Follow me or you are going to hell. But I'm not sure that that definition of the apostles' teaching in the Bible is actually what's going on here. I think it was less about rules, what to do and what not to do, and more about why and how they were living out faith in God and connection with people. I mean, when you read the passages, you could literally see the quality of their spirituality in the early church. The passage describes how they acted towards one another with kindness, with forgiveness, how they resolved disputes, how they shared things together. So yes, they did the what stuff, which is same as us. They listened to messages. They were devoted to their prayers. They showed up on YouTube on time. They went to the temple and had connect groups in homes regularly. So... They did these things, but only in so far as it grew them and expanded their connection to God and to people. So it was never for the sake of doing these things. No, they did it out of devotion to God and to each other. They worshipped with, you know, adjectives like joy and simplicity. They reached out to others with the hope that more people will experience the good life that they were living. So, so being a part of a community of God is more than being a part of a set of rules. It's about being a part of a shared philosophy of life and spirituality. Now, of course, I'm using the word philosophy kind of loosely here today. Jesus is more than a philosophy. Jesus is a person. But because we love the person of Jesus, we choose to live by his philosophy. 
You see, in order for us to be a church, the evolution, it is so important for you to know why you are here in this community. You need to know the values and the vision that we hold. The culture, the attitudes, the way of life, the ways of seeing our faith, of reading the Bible, that is the reason why you started coming here. You know, when I was a young pastor, I used to be so excited when some of you guys, new peeps, would come up to me and tell me how much you love our church. You know, man, this church is so amazing. The people are so awesome. Your messages really speak to me. You know, I've been looking for a place like this all my life. You know, heck, sometimes the church you are describing is even better than the one I've been imagining. But here's the thing. You know, we say those things because in that very moment, the evolution is filling a need in our life. You know, maybe we are lonely. Maybe we've come with questions about our lives and career. You know, everyone, when we first start coming to a church, it's always because of relevance. But listen, you will only stay if you develop resonance. You know, I'm glad that our church has met so many people's needs, and I'm really proud that so many of your friends who are not Christians watch our content, listen to our message podcast. Extremely proud. It means we are making a difference. It means that we've built a church that is really relevant to people's lives. But what I want more than relevance is people who stay here because of resonance, which is a very different thing. You know, that's the thing about resonance. It's about becoming one heart and one mind with the people here. So now when anyone tells me, man, this is the church I've been looking for all my life, I'm happy, but I always go mostly to myself in the back of my mind. Cool. Let's see how you feel in a couple of months or years time when church is no longer so perfect in your life. Because what we want is not to collect TiVo followers. What we're looking to do is to build a community, one that actually makes a difference in the world we are in. And for that to happen, we don't need more followers. We need participants. We need a team. We need leaders, people who deeply share our philosophy of Jesus. You see, often what tends to happen in Christianity is that people take on the philosophies of this world versus truly living out the values and vision of Jesus Christ. Now, some things in the world are great. I mean, I love the creativity that our team has been able to run with. I love how we've been able to integrate ideas from leadership and science into our contemporary expression of faith. But we also sometimes unknowingly take on systems like capitalism, consumerism, and the unhealthy version of relationships that those systems create in our world. For example, we start being Christians who want a God who meets our needs. We want a church that enables us instead of changes us. We want a version of community that fits conveniently into our lives and schedule without having to change anything. And when it comes to leadership even in church, we climb the leadership ladder here as though we're climbing the corporate ladder of success, position, and prestige. We do team, like we're trying to attain grades and show off good grades. And when we don't get what we want, we start to initiate divorce proceedings. You see, some religious leaders are afraid that this whole phenomenon in our generation is a crisis of people's spirituality. But I would argue actually not at all. In fact, I believe we're living in a time where there is a great yearning in our generation for spiritual things, to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. So I think the crisis we are facing in the world today is not a crisis of spirituality, it's a crisis of relationship. We don't know how to be in shared relationship with each other. We're so bad at it, but now we're also bad at it when it comes to God, and we're bad at it when it comes to being a team. You know, can I share with you one little story in the Bible that has always inspired me? And it's the story of Joseph Basabas, or some Bibles say his surname was Justus. And, and it's this really obscure guy. You're probably going to wonder, like, huh, who is this guy? Well, listen, let me give you the context. This was just before Pentecost happened. 
And the 500 disciples had witnessed Jesus' ascension to heaven. Jesus had told them to wait for the Holy Spirit. But by Acts 1, about 40 days later, only 120 of them were left waiting. I guess the waiting was just too hard. I can sort of relate right now. But in the midst of 120 disciples gathering together, just before the Holy Spirit comes, Peter stands out and says, we need to replace Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. We were once 12 disciples, now we are 11. So let's nominate the best among us, someone who's been with us from the start to take the vacant spot in the team. Now this is how the story goes. Acts 1, 23. So they nominated two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's deep thoughts and desires. Show us clearly which one you have chosen among these two to take the place uh, of ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned away to his own place. When they cast lots, the Lord fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. I want you to picture what's going on here, okay? Two were nominated, and they, the whole 120 group, prayed, Lord, you know everyone's deepest thoughts and desires. Show us whom you have chosen. Joseph Basibus was not chosen. Oof. I mean, talk about a situation, right, where the leadership team or the whole group really could have exercised a little bit more EQ. But that's relationships for you. It's never perfect. The best you can do is try to build a good community, right? But here's how Joseph inspires me. After this whole situation, guess what? Joseph didn't leave the church. He didn't throw a tantrum. He didn't sink into self-pity or self-rejection. In fact, in Christian tradition, it's believed that he went on to become bishop to Eleutherapolis, a Roman and Byzantine city in Syria, Palestine. It was a challenging place, a place that experienced genocide, went through numerous political challenges and war, but it later became known as City of the Free. And Joseph was bishop there. Joseph also was martyred there and later became known as Saint Justice because like his surname, he was a man of justice and integrity. So my takeaway from his brief mention in the Bible is that there was this culture, this attitude, a spirit about the early church where they were devoted to shared values and vision, not self-absorbed position or prestige. You know, the Bible describes to us that they did have leadership structures. They looked more or less like the religious councils or political committees of that time. They had administration and hierarchy where it was needed, but the thing that made the early church different was something internal. They had a commitment to a shared philosophy that was not about comparison or competition, but about a shared devotion to God's values in community, to Jesus' vision for their future. So friend, I want to say to you, don't stop at coming to our church just because it's relevant to you. Instead, be devoted to developing a resonance with God and with the TiVo family. So today, I want you to jot down two questions right now to answer for yourself this week, okay? The first is, what can I do to be more engaged with the values of God? Secondly, what can I do to be more engaged with the vision of the evolution? Because we want to have a shared philosophy, amen? So my next observation is the early church was devoted to values and vision, but to also creating, number two, healthy relationships. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, again, it says, To their shared meals and to their prayers, every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. Now, let me tell you, this is an awesome picture. I cannot imagine that being such a joyful community came easy to them. In fact, from the Bible's description, I know that it didn't come easy because they were also people busy with their lives and careers. 
They were also like us people that were probably concerned with their finances. You know, majority of the early church, you know, scholars tell us were made out of people who were living below average income. So, you know, and then there was stuff like racism, cultural differences. Do you think they didn't have to figure out how to include others in community, especially the marginalized groups like women, children, people of other races? No, listen, the Bible tells us that there were disputes in the church often enough. One time, food aid to the poor was being unequally distributed, more of it going to the Jewish widows while the Gentile widows were neglected. Another time, there was a huge fight over what food they could eat and about circumcision. You see, the Gentiles had grown up eating meat with blood, but for the Jews, this was violating their religious beliefs. So what did they do? The Gentiles in the church said, we will stop eating meat with blood for your sake. And so the Jews went, you know, at first they were going, you know, the Gentiles need to be circumcised, and the Gentiles were like, no way. (laughs) And the Jews went, okay, you are sacrificing you know, your eating habits for us, so we will let go of this ritual for your sake. They found a way to get along. Not in a shallow, we'll agree to disagree kind of way. No, they created new policies, new boundaries, new dynamics for getting along. They found substantial ways to respect one another and to make space for each other. They came to shared understandings, shared convictions. They found ways to process, to work things out when they came up. You see, that is real intentional commitment to healthy relationship. Again, not a perfect journey, but a devotion to doing better together. You see, what sort of community we end up building here at TiVo depends on us. Whether this is a community that shares, has an atmosphere of gladness and simplicity, it is up to us. Now, if you are, you know, at your core, you know, opposed to the kind of philosophy and church that we are building, then listen, it's going to be very hard for you to fit in. It's better to right now start looking, you know, you're on YouTube, go start looking for another church to go to. But if you do share our philosophy, if you do want to participate in this dream that we're building of of a church that just, that's not just about you, then understand this. How we do relationships with each other matters. You know, we can be positively contagious with our emotions. We can also negatively catch each other's bad emotions. We can be contagious with healthy relational patterns. We can also be dangerous with bad relationship patterns. Because remember the open loop limbic system we talked about earlier? You see, that same system that our brain uses to get us born is also a system that's susceptible to a thing called mirroring. Now, don't freak out. I know the term has been used a lot to describe narcissists and sociopaths, how they can show us what we want them to feel, you know? They can use it to manipulate us, right? But originally, mirroring actually refers to how human beings can can catch feelings from one another. So, for example, right, a conversation can start between two of us. And in the beginning, the two of us, when we are sitting talking, our bodies and emotions and rhythms are at different tempos. But by the end of a conversation, by the end of 15 minutes, our behavior and our rhythm of moving and speaking starts to become similar. That is the phenomenon called mirroring. You see, in groups, it's what allows a group to become cohesive. And the more cohesive a group, the stronger our shared moods, the stronger our emotional history, the stronger our emotional triggers, the things that we believe in in common. And so we can use this to create a great space to be in and thrive in, or we can use it to create a terrible space to degenerate in. But here's the good news, right? Do you know God has actually designed us to be more inclined to build good community and good spaces versus bad ones? You see, our brains, here's another interesting fact, are actually designed to detect positive emotions. So a study at Yale found, right, that that of all the emotions that spread easily, cheerfulness and warmth ranked number one. 
While things like irritability are actually less contagious, and in fact, depression spreads hardly at all. So all those of you right now struggling with feeling a little bit down during this pandemic, be kind to yourself, don't worry, you are not a burden, neither is your sadness contagious to the rest of us. Okay, so, so go easy on yourself. For those of you who are irritable and taking your anger out on other people during this pandemic, maybe it's time to check your relational attitude. Because not only is your attitude not that contagious, it actually will repel good people out of your life. But here's the thing, are you ready? Here's the thing about smiles and warmth and laughter and joy. Yale found that these, especially laughter, involves highly complex neural systems in our brain and body that are hard to fake, unless you're a psychopath. So when it's real, laughter is actually the shortest distance between relationships. It's immense bonding. It causes teams to synthesize and to step into higher levels of health and productivity. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. And that's a space and relationships that I want to spend time and energy in. A space and community that's committed to relational health, that's committed to healthy emotions and process. But to do that, listen, shared values is something we've got to believe in. Healthy dynamics in church and relationships has got to be something that we are committed to. You know, all the stuff we've talked about recently, inner work, self-awareness, social awareness has got to be something we value and keep working on together. And that is how we turn this into a church that we want to be a part of, that other people, great people, will want to be a part of too. So some more questions to ask yourself this week, okay? What can I do to be emotionally healthier as a person? And what can I do to be relationally healthier for others? Because we want to build healthy relationships. Last one, number three. They were also devoted to practices that reflected their convictions. So the early church did not just claim to follow Jesus. They didn't just claim to be a community. They practiced. They had rhythms patterns, habits, ways of responding, ways of acting that aligned with what they believed. I mean, just look at what Acts 2 says. I mean, it basically says they prayed together and grew spiritually together. They lived with love, generosity, kindness towards each other so that others around them loved it. They added to the church daily because people liked them and wanted to join them. They served each other and the community cheerfully. They had practices patterns that reflected their convictions. You see, guys, being a Christian isn't a noun. It's a verb. You know, it isn't a title you get. It's an attitude, an action that you practice on the daily. So I want to reiterate, you come to church because of relevance, but you should stay because of resonance. You see, staying requires resonance. Resonance requires practice. It requires us to tune and align ourselves to our convictions. Whether that be the vision of the evolution, whether that be the way we conduct our relationships with one another. You know, here's an interesting thing, right? When we were in our previous church premise, there was this thing that occasionally would happen during our worship rehearsals and gatherings. And that is, all of a sudden, mid-rehearsal, you know, one of the strings, not all of the strings on either the acoustic guitar or the bass guitar, would on its own suddenly start vibrating really violently. You know, you could be strumming all the strings, but one string on its own will suddenly escalate and the resulting sound will literally cut through and disrupt the entire band and the sound in the room. You know, in fact, this was such a really funny phenomenon because sometimes it would happen even when we weren't doing anything. You know, the band wasn't playing, maybe we were discussing arrangements and suddenly the keyboardist was hitting a note to test a chord and it would trigger one of the strings on the guitar to start vibrating on its own. And then it would in turn trigger feedback on the PA system. I learned later that this is what can be labeled as something called dissonance. You see, every space... Every church, every object has a sort of tuning of its own, a note or a sound, if you will. So generally, when you tune instruments, 
And to have a, you know, all of us have a matching bass line. You play, the notes come together, sounds from the different instruments blend, but they also bounce off each other and they multiply off each other. And that is resonance. Resonance fills and bounces off the space you are in. And that is how you get more than just music. You get a feeling in the room. You know, this is why great musicians pay a lot of money to record in specific venues because of the resonance they can create with that space. You see, resonance is the multiplication of sound when notes come together. Now, if you harness resonance well, it can be a thing of beauty. But if you harness it badly, ooh, right? So, but sometimes, however, for whatever reason, the sound of a particular string or instrument is out of sync with the band or sometimes even fundamentally out of sync with the room. Now, when it's a mouse situation, just a string out of tune, you know, you can tell, right, the guitar is out of tune and then it makes the rest of the band kind of sound kind of weird. It's not as musical, not as wonderful. You just have to tune the instrument. But occasionally, it can be a severe dissonance. One violently vibrating string can destroy all the beautiful music a band is playing. And sometimes it can cause so much problems that we have to reset the preset EQs that we've created for that room. So the same idea is true of community. In order for things to be beautiful, there's got to be the correct resonance in us. We have to learn to listen, to play off each other, sometimes blend together, but also bounce off one another. Agreeing, disagreeing, aligning, adjusting. We have to do regular tuning of our lives and our attitudes and our patterns. In more challenging situations, it might require us swapping out strings and changing presets in our lives. And that's what practices do for community. Practices of being warm, Practices of laughing a lot together. Practices of self-awareness and talking through our problems together. Practices of respect. You know, teachings that Jesus has taught us of forgiveness and grace. You know, practices of self-control in our thoughts, how we speak, how we act towards other people. You see, the early church was intentional about these practices. They wanted it to reflect their convictions. And whenever something came up, they took time to align. If something needed to improve, they were committed to making changes. So really, it wasn't what they preached that made them the church of Jesus. It is what they practiced together in community. And as they did, they became a church that excited God. They became a church that excited the world around them. So final questions for today. What patterns can I have that better reflect my convictions? And what practices will help me resonate with our community here at The Evolution? Because let me promise you this, this is not a church where you are in danger of losing yourself. In fact, more likely as you commit, you will find yourself. This is not a space where you will lose out on things for your future, in fact, you will end up gaining a team and gain a better future. Because that's what happens when a church comes together and is of one heart and mind about good stuff, about our philosophy, about our relationships, about our practices and our convictions. You see, this is what I love about this verse in Acts 4. They were of one heart and one mind. And the Bible says because they were of one heart and one mind, there was abundance of grace at work among them all. Grace of the Holy Spirit was among them all. Not just the leaders of the church, but everyone that was participating in that community. Grace was on them all. So today I want to encourage you to make this one of your prayers for God to teach you how to resonate with Him and with our church to resonate with our shared philosophy, to resonate with the area of healthy relationships, and to practice what reflects our convictions. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you are a great God who wants to build a great church. And we ask you to this season, even as we are away in different spaces and places, that yet somehow our hearts will resonate 
with one philosophy, with one belief, with one vision for the future as a community, God. We ask you to touch lives. We ask you to minister to lives. We ask you to put a heart and a vision for bigger things for our church. I just ask you right now, God, touch them wherever they are. Minister to them. Help them to grow. Help them to change. Help them to transform, God. Because I believe you call us to build something great together. We bless you in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen.